A warning to listeners. This episode contains descriptions of sexual violence. One day, back in June of 2017, a young woman walked up and down a bustling street in Washington, D.C. She was carrying with her a stack of paper flyers that she passed out in bars and restaurants and in cafes. But these flyers, they were unusual. They weren't advertisements or lost and found posters. Instead, they had screenshots of something called a case docket. It's like a timeline of the major events of a criminal court case, and it has the names of judges and lawyers and defendants. This docket showed that a man pleaded guilty to charges of sexual abuse. There were several photos of him, and at the top of the flyers, in bright red capital letters, it said, This man has assaulted six women in D.C., These flyers were a warning. The woman who handed them out, at the time, she didn't want her identity to be known. She was a victim. But she was a lot more than that. And her story started me on a reporting journey that has lasted for nearly three years. A story that has played out in the middle of a larger cultural reckoning. This is Canary, an investigative podcast from The Washington Post. Chapter 1. The System Failed Us. I'm Amy Britton, and I'm an investigative reporter. Three years ago, I was sitting in the Washington Post newsroom when I got a call. It was an attorney who knew I had worked on stories about sexual assault, and she had a tip for me. It was about a woman who had been in the shadows but now wanted to step forward. She was ready to share her account of a sexual assault and everything that happened after. I wanted to hear more. Stories about abuse and assault can crack open a window into our society to show just how pervasive and damaging sexual violence can be. And sometimes these stories, they can lead you to other stories and take you in directions you don't expect. So I reached out to Lauren Clark, the woman who handed out those flyers. (laughs) Right now we're walking into... A Mortal Beloved, the salon where I work. Lauren is a hairstylist in D.C. She's 34 years old, and when I first met her, back in 2017, she was working at one of the city's most popular salons. And this is Danny, our receptionist. Hi. She always wanted to be a hairstylist. I would read fashion magazines and look at, you know, movies and music videos and be like, oh, I could make that happen. I could do that look. And then I would practice at home and then started like practicing on people like my sister. Um, And then it became a choice for a career. And eventually, yeah, I decided that was what I wanted to do. Her work days are spent cutting hair, styling hair and talking to her clients. (laughs) I think as a hairdresser, I meet so many different types of people, and I have great friends. It's nice to have a dynamic group of people surrounding you. You can draw inspiration from different places and get different insights and perspectives. They're like, oh, will you go to this show with me? I'm like, who's that? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> There's always something to do. I really enjoy karaoke. It's kind of a similar feeling of, you know, just kind of letting letting loose. I spend a lot of time reading. I spend a lot of time um, in the park. I like to be outdoors. So we're in Glover Park, this safe, cute little neighborhood and uh, this is where it happened. In April of 2013, Lauren was wrapping up after a long day of work at the salon. 
She went home and she changed into running clothes and she took off for a late night run just like she had done many times before. She was by herself, minding her own business, exercising like many women do in the city. And then in the distance, she saw a man approaching. And I just got this like feeling like across the street. And I was like, that's crazy. Like he's just a normal person he's going home to. What you are about to hear in the next minute is a description of sexual assault. Lauren is going to describe what happened to her, and it could be difficult to hear her talk about it. And then I passed by him, and I got like a couple steps past him. And suddenly this man came up from behind, and... I just feel his hand like over my mouth, and his other hand in between my legs, and his body against my back. He grabbed her vagina. And he just slammed me into the ground. And he tackled her. My knees hit the ground. My elbows hit the ground. She felt like she was fighting for her life. I kind of hit his face and like scratched it and it ripped his glasses off. That's when he punched me. He punched me in the nose and I just remember my head hitting the sidewalk. I just was so mad. It went from like escape to like rage and I then fought back and I went to swing at him and at at that point like he like got up um and then he was taking off When Lauren's attacker ran away, he also stole her cell phone. She chased after him, and someone passing by helped her flag down the police. Everything happened really quickly from there. Police caught the man, and they even linked him to an attack against a woman earlier that night. The man had scratches on his face, and he promptly confessed, and he was arrested. The fact that the police caught the suspect so quickly and the fact that he confessed, all of that is really unusual in sexual assault cases. Most sexual assaults never end up being tried in the criminal justice system. His name was Jairo Cruz. He was 24 years old, and as it turns out, he was a chef in a restaurant in Washington, D.C., Afterwards, a detective assured Lauren that with all of that evidence, Cruz would be facing a felony charge. Just a few days later, she found out that prosecutors did not charge Cruz with a felony. Instead, he was charged with lesser misdemeanors. Misdemeanor sexual abuse for the attacks on Lauren and the other woman that night. Misdemeanor assault for the punch against Lauren and theft for taking Lauren's cell phone. And two of those charges were later dropped as part of a plea deal. So in the end, Cruz pleaded guilty to one charge of misdemeanor assault and two charges of misdemeanor sexual abuse. And because they were misdemeanors, Cruz would not have to register as a sex offender. It like, it was just, it just felt cheap. What happened to me felt so much worse than that. A misdemeanor sounds like something like, oh, like, don't do that again, you know? And like, it just was so much bigger for me than I guess what I think a misdemeanor is. During the sentencing, Lauren would get the chance to tell the court how the assault affected her. This type of speech is called a victim impact statement. I didn't know if there was anything I could say that would really change anything, but I knew that I wanted to say it anyway. I knew that I had an option to, to speak up, and I wanted to take it. Lauren would be speaking directly to the judge in the case, Truman Morrison. He was one of the longest-serving judges on the Superior Court of the District of Columbia and a nationally known advocate for criminal justice reform. She spent hours working on a draft of what she was going to say to Judge Morrison. Unfortunately, the court doesn't release audio to reporters, but Lauren later read her statement to me. 
a forceful hand over my mouth, another between my legs. The collision of a man's body against my own, pavement, panic, pain. For days, I can still feel his hands on me. With each step I took, I felt the sidewalk tearing into my skin again, and my own reflection reminding me of the man who left my face swollen and bruised. Those sensations subsided, only to be replaced by anxiety and fear. Most nights, I laid in bed waiting for the first chirp and the sun to come up, too afraid to close my eyes. During these court hearings, there was a bombshell that came out in the courtroom. As part of the evaluation for his sentencing, Jairo Cruz admitted to attacking four other women in the past in very similar crimes. This information was apparently never shared with the police. So I don't know the identity of these four other women, and I don't know if their cases were ever investigated. In total, Jairo Cruz admitted to attacking six women. Later on, I would reach out to Cruz and he'd decline an interview, but he would issue an apology. The judge, Truman Morrison, also wouldn't agree to an interview with me about Lauren's case. But in 2013, in court, Judge Morrison referred to the crime as, quote, as serious a misdemeanor as a judge sees. That's according to court transcripts. He also called it a, quote, difficult and unusual case, one marked by, quote, dramatic, gratuitous violence. Cruz's defense attorney said that Cruz's father died when he was a boy and that it led to a rough childhood. The defense attorney pointed to Cruz's alcohol problems and said that Cruz had been drinking before these attacks. Judge Morrison challenged this defense. He said, you know, millions of people drink too much and don't go around um, assaulting women uh, that they don't know on the street violently. And that was really nice to hear uh, the judge say. Um, and, you know, I think he he didn't take lightly um, the things that I said and my he didn't take my experience lightly. Judge Morrison took a lot of time to decide this case. He ended up having two more hearings just to talk through all of the options for Cruz. Lauren didn't attend. She had already misworked twice for this case. So when the final sentence was handed down, Lauren wasn't there to hear it. Ultimately, Judge Morrison decided to sentence Cruz to 80 days in a halfway house, five years supervised probation, and 10 days in jail. But it wasn't 10 days straight. 10 days served in two-day stints in order to accommodate Cruz's work schedule as a chef. When you, when you were speaking in court and you gave your victim impact statement, and then you saw the outcome with what the judge decided to sentence Cruz to, do you feel like the judge actually heard you, understood what you were saying? Do you feel like your words had any impact? Honestly, I feel like when the judge asked or said that he was going to take, you know, some time to like deliberate and think about what he had heard from my statement and from Cruz's statement, um, he rescheduled, you know, his decision and I didn't go to that. Yeah, I felt like he just didn't want to say it to my face. If I hadn't been there that day and uh, made that statement, I don't know what the judge how he would have ruled. It's hard to think that, like, <laughs> it would have been an even more, uh, I guess, reduced sentence, that it would have been less jail time. Um, and that, you know, me going and, and saying what I said. And I'm glad that I went. I'm glad that I made my statement. Um, I felt like the judge heard me. I don't know if it mattered enough. A few years went by, and Lauren tried to move on. Eventually, she began therapy. She was gripped by these panic attacks that really started to disrupt her work life and social life. She tried to channel this anger and disappointment into something more positive. 
she turned to advocacy work. And she organized a march for other sexual assault survivors in D.C. But it was hard to pretend like things were back to normal for Lauren. Especially because after the attacks, Cruz's career kind of took off. He got a new job at Le Diplomat, which was one of the hottest restaurants in town. And this restaurant happened to be just a few blocks away from Lauren's salon. He was unavoidable. She saw him at a bar. She saw him outside of her apartment. Once, when she was cutting hair, she even saw him walk by the salon window. It wasn't okay with me, like, him being so close. Like, how am I supposed to live? Like, how am I supposed to, like, just live my life? She was terrified. She needed some feeling of security, some reassurance that someone somewhere was watching him. He was supposed to be on supervised probation. So she went to the court website, she found the case docket, and she saw a note that there had been a recent hearing, a hearing in her case, and no one had told her about it, which is actually a violation of her rights as a crime victim. And at that hearing, the one that she wasn't there for, Cruz's probation officer revealed that there had been a mistake. Over the past four years, Cruz was supposed to be getting treatment for his violent sexual tendencies. This was supposed to be a crucial part of his probation and rehabilitation. But it never happened. Instead of any meaningful attempt at rehabilitation, it seemed as if he had been monitored like a low-level drug offender. Judge Morrison said that despite all of those failures, the chef had been on pretty good behavior and really didn't need to be monitored any longer. So he moved Cruz to unsupervised probation. At this point in the story, a lot of people would have just accepted this outcome. It had been years since the assault. What could Lauren really do? It got to the point where, you know, my well-being had been sacrificed so many times that if, if no one else was going to make it a priority, I was going to make it a priority. So she made it a priority. She filed a motion for a new hearing to get him back into court. And she printed out those paper flyers, the flyers with the photos of Jairo Cruz and the details of his case docket. And she walked up and down that busy street in D.C., handing them out. It was more, I started with people that I, I knew that were in the restaurant industry and confided in them and asked them to share this with their staff members and keep it in the back of the house. She said she felt morally compelled to warn her community about Cruz and about what he had done. I knew that I wanted to feel safe, and I just, I didn't know what else to do with it. I I didn't want to do anything, like, harmful or illegal. The flyers seemed to have an immediate effect. Soon after they were passed around, Cruz was no longer employed at the upscale French restaurant Le Diplomat. A spokesperson for the restaurant group has said they don't comment on personnel issues. And something else happened because of the flyers. Several other women came forward, and they alleged that Jairo Cruz had sexually assaulted them when he was on probation. Two women said that when they were working at a restaurant with Cruz, he engaged in unwanted sexual contact. One of these women said that when she was in the restaurant's storage room, he penetrated her with his fingers without her consent. One woman told me that she met Cruz through a dating app. She said he engaged in unwanted sexual contact with her when she was drunk and unable to give consent. That woman, Emily Schimmel, said that she had passed out in her bed, and when she woke up, she found herself without any clothes on and Cruz naked. And she said she had no memory of what happened. When Emily Schimmel found out about those flyers, She said that she went out to her car and she cried for an hour. She said that she felt like it never should have happened. When I reached out to Cruz in late 2018 for Lauren's story, he said he thinks it's important for women to talk about sexual assault. But, quote, I do not believe the addition of my story at this time will help move the conversation forward. For the people I've hurt, I can only hope that they are able to find peace. There is no excusing my actions. 
I cannot take them back, but will continue to try and learn from my mistakes in hopes that I make up for the harm I have caused. End quote. You might be wondering what happened after Lauren filed her legal motion. She claimed her rights were violated by how the justice system had handled her case. She actually ended up back in court. It had been four years since her first time speaking to the judge in the case, Truman Morrison. And now she got the chance to do something rare. To give a second statement to the judge about how she had been affected as a crime victim. I asked Lauren to read her statement from the court transcript. I understand why survivors of sexual assault don't report the crimes committed against them. It's like signing up to be re-traumatized. It's a battle that tethers us to pain we never asked for and most certainly never deserved. However, I'm here today, Your Honor, to say that this man has done more than enough to deserve the sentence you imposed four years ago and that he still deserves it today. I deserve to feel safe and so does this community. How many people have to hold their sisters, their friends, their lovers or their daughters while they weep because of the things that this man has done? It blows my mind that Mr. Cruz didn't have to register as a sex offender. It is even more insane to me that he hasn't taken the sex offender treatment assessment that was rightfully included in his sentence. This man said himself that he's sick and he told you that he has a problem. Why don't you take his word for it? I certainly do. Judge Morrison apologized to Lauren that day. He said it was wrong to hold a hearing without her knowledge. And he changed his mind. He put Cruz back on supervised probation, and he ordered the probation agency to fix their mistakes in the case. Here's what the judge said to Lauren. Quote, I've been a judge now for 37 years, and I don't remember ever having heard a more eloquent or forceful articulation of what it was like to be a victim in a case like this than the one that you've just rendered. And I'm extremely grateful to you for having the courage to come forward and say the things that you've just said. And I apologize to you that the system didn't enable you to be here, either yourself or with your lawyer at the time that you had a right to be. I can only say to you I did not willfully violate your rights. We just weren't paying attention. After all of this, I just kept coming back to Lauren's decision to hand out those flyers. I asked her why she did it. All I did was tell the truth. And I did it to give myself a safe environment to live in. Did you feel better after doing it? Better is like such a relative term. I felt better knowing I wasn't going to see him walk past the salon. I felt better knowing that like I wasn't going to again eat at a restaurant where he works without knowing it. I felt better that people refused to accept this type of behavior and stood with me. But it wasn't like I just felt better. One of the things that, especially in the aftermath of the Me Too movement, a lot of these stories are now looking at what we call the systems, you know, that enabled this type of behavior for years. And you and I have talked about this a lot. But when you look back at this case, how do you look at the system? You know, did the system fail you? Yeah, the system failed me. The system failed my community. The system failed us. The system failed him. It failed. (laughs) I'm sure that I'm not the only person that this has been hard for. And I think that in a lot of ways, the system made it a lot harder. Lauren's story was published in the Washington Post in early 2019. It was co-authored by reporter Mara Jekis, and it was titled, The Man Who Attacked Me Works in Your Kitchen. Victim of Serial Groper Took Justice Into Her Own Hands. Throughout that day and the following days, we got a lot of emails and comments from readers. They were reaching out to say why the story stuck with them. People from all over the world were telling us that they felt really connected to Lauren and that they even felt inspired by her. They also had a lot of opinions about Lauren and what she did. 
whether it was right or whether it was wrong or if she had even gone too far. People were also really upset about D.C.'s criminal justice system. They were mad at the prosecutors for charging these crimes as misdemeanors. They were mad at the probation officers, and they were mad at the judge for giving a 10-day jail sentence to a man who attacked six women. So after the story published and after I answered as many emails and comments as I could, I moved on to the next story, and it had nothing to do with sexual assault. I thought I was done with these types of stories for a while. And then, on one Saturday evening in February of 2019, I got an email. It read, Hi Amy, my name is Carol, and I have some information that may be pertinent to your recent article. It is very sensitive information for me, implicating a person in your story. I appreciate your reporting and the work you do around around this this issue. issue. It's truly making a difference for survivors like myself. In fact, the grace it has afforded me has compelled me to pay it forward. It is the inspiration for my reaching out to you. Best to you, Carol. I learned a new name that day, Carol Griffin. What she would tell me, it would change the way I looked at the story I had just published, and it would give new meaning to the system that failed Lauren Clark. Soon, Carol would name the person she was implicating in that email. And it was a name I had heard before, a name I'd even quoted in my first story, a name that was all over Jairo Cruz's case docket. Judge Truman Morrison. In the next chapter of Canary. I could hear somebody whispering my name, and it was like, Carol, Carol. I know that she has spent a lot of time going back and sort of replaying it, you know, and trying to figure out what she did. There's a shadow hanging heavy. There's a cold chill in my bones. It's a steel. It's a long, long way from home But I will not try